Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Adam. Thanks for coming on the podcast. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, all good. You? Yeah, really good. Thank you. A little bit warm uh, as we're yeah. experiencing a heat wave in, in England as we are chatting today. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, I'm really, really great. I'm really looking forward to to hearing your story. Um, of course, I, I had the privilege of being a student of yours. I'm still kind of a student of yours um, with Toon Boon Harmony. And, uh, but I've always been intrigued how you got to that point of training people. Uh, so I'm really, really excited to hear your full story and how it all got started. Um, but to begin with, I want to go right back to the beginning. Um, tell the listeners a little bit about where you were born, uh, have you moved around the UK um, or worldwide? And have you, you know, education, then your first job, and then how did you get into this mad industry? And then how did you start your own business? So over to you, Adam. All right. Thanks very much. And thanks for having me on. Uh, it's uh, It's fun to have an opportunity to talk about it and share it because it's 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 like I was inspired by people who did their own thing and kind of diverged. And as you'll hear, um, I came from not a, a background of working in the creative arts or anything like that. So, yeah, for me, I was born in Nottinghamshire, uh, in the middle of the country. Uh, it's you know my my dad's a painter. My mom was a stay at home mom, so it wasn't like we had a kind of a creative background or anything like that. Uh, but I was encouraged to, like a lot of kids, you know, drawing and stuff. And I was encouraged to just keep doing that. Yeah. Um, my mom used to use the stairs as kind of like we had stairs with like a wooden panel on it. And she used to use it as a bit of a gallery. So I used to stick my brother and my pictures up there. So nice. that kind of um, kept me, yeah, kept me going with it. And and I started making comics at school. Um, and then comics kind of got me interested in, oh, hang on, they do this comic before a film and that's storyboarding. And then I kind of got into you know, animation that way. Uh, after after school, I went to university uh, in Southampton and studied animation there. And I made my own film, which was a little bit, it still is a little bit unique to make your own film all on your own at university. Yeah. But it, it taught me so much about the whole process. You know, I learned about storyboarding, animatics. Uh, it was all hand-drawn as well. So it was all in 2D yeah. and all on paper um and yeah a lot of bit you know a lot about editing and and all kinds of things around that so that's sort of how i got into animation i've always liked art and my background i do like sports as well but it's uh it was always kind of a thing where you know you don't fit in any one group if you if you like sports and you like arts there's people tend to stick in one especially at school yes. so um yeah. i used to kind of put on two hats a little bit but yeah, that's where I got to. And then I, I I started working, I graduated, started working in and around animation. Um, I graduated in 2007, uh, just in time for the financial crash, like come in the next year. So it was a bit ridiculous, to be honest, because every studio I went to said there's no work here, basically, especially in 2D. Yes. And it hadn't fully gone over to compute. I mean, people were using computers and things like Flash or Adobe Animate and things. Yeah. But it wasn't like at the level nowhere near that we are now. Mm. The internet was still not able to hold that level of data. So it was still like very much in house. Yeah. Um, there, there was still a lot of the changing of the guard thing going on with, with people in terms of animation, like the old guys using stuff on paper, not quite into computers. And so right. it, um, it basically meant that I started working more in like graphics and illustration. And I started to, I kind of came up with this plan after about a year of searching for work in animation. I was like, okay, how am I going to get to where I want to be with it? So I thought, yeah. well, if I try and do graphic stuff and then an illustration job and then maybe a little music video and, you know, those kind of bits, I just started to edge my way towards it. Um, yeah. And I always kind of had the plan to, to get into animation as an industry and learn the skills and then try and set something up myself a little bit. 
because okay. my dad as a painter and decorator run his own business and right. you know, some people will be like you know they'll think oh that's not that much of a business business but there's everything in there you know you still need mm. to manage the people who work for you, you still need to get uh, you know you've got your vans and stuff to look out for you still got to organize all your books and all your clients and yes so um i kind of grew up seeing that happen and then uh yeah i guess it gave me the taste for it really okay and and so so there was is there anywhere in your family kind of background an artistic streak with anybody you said not with your mum and dad but anybody else further back well there's i mean there's creativity like uh, uh, in terms of my i see my mum as creative well i see i often say this to people as well that i feel like everybody is creative in their own way you know it will find its way yes. you'll find somebody who works in an office which people would regard as one of you know they'll they'll say well that job's really boring but they'll still find some creativity like the way they choose to dress at the weekend or the food they cook or that kind of thing it's it kind of the way they decorate their home it's all kind of little creative sort of outlets so my mom's was um the way she told us stories as kids uh, she would kind of like enrich the story uh, she would record it and put on the different voices and things um and when wow. she got us to draw the stories it would be kind of you know that kind of thing so and then my dad's creativity he he was trained originally as a an engineer uh, when it was kind right. of you you made all your own measuring tools and things it was like part of a, an apprenticeship scheme the government ran, uh, ran like maggie thatcher time so it was um oh. he his creativity came from kind of mechanically doing things uh you know yes. like he was into motorbikes and cars and stuff so there was there was that level uh but it was it was very different. My one of my great uncles was an illustrator, but I never really knew him. So I used to now and again see postcards, but it was you know. Okay. So yeah, so, it's 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 kind of a bit of a. And my granddad's he he used to draw a little bit, but you know not right. Like... No, but I'm always intrigued if there is a thread in a family, and I mean what you described. I, I really enjoy storytelling and it's what I teach some of my clients to become better storytellers. And the way your mum kind of embellished storytelling, I think that will have helped a big deal, you yeah. know, for your own creativity and just visualizing things in your own mind, I guess. So yeah, that sounds brilliant. So, yeah, it's that thing. Sorry to interrupt. I was just say it's that thing of when you don't have, um, like I think nowadays somebody might have an iPad and they might show somebody, you know, here's something to watch. Whereas when we were younger, I mean, it's you know weren't poor by any sense of the imagination, but in as terms of a more of a working class family in the eighties uh, yeah. and early nineties in in the UK not with loads of money thrown around so it was books and stuff but you did have to use your imagination and you did get bored and so she'd yes. tell you this story and then you'd get paper from she used to work in this like shop that was like a wine shop and they'd wrap it up in brown paper so she used All to right. just bring me loads of the paper back and just give me that and some crayons and so you'd just draw on that because it's like a never-ending sketchbook um <laughs> so that you know that boredom and that story i guess just kind of like fueled the the creative process yeah that sounds amazing that's i mean that's so great to be able to have done that so you so did you get a job as such with somebody in the end yes um so i mean i did little jobs here and there i worked for like a design firm where i did kind of illustration but i started to do graphics for them and then little bits of website stuff um because mm -hmm. i taught myself that when i was about 15 just from a book okay. and i kind of got interested in that but i always got pulled back to doing the more animation illustration -y side, of th side of things so yeah that was um I kind of did little bits like that. I, my first proper animation job, you know, where I wasn't working for myself as a kind of a, you know, just doing a corporate thing or a music video. I I got a job doing, uh, working on a feature film, a hand-drawn one up in Scotland, which was a French film. So uh, the film, The Illusionist, which 
basically had lots of satellite studios off it. Uh, that that's one of those studios was up in Dundee, and mm. I ended up going to work with them on the production after uh, the Illusionist. So they had all the stuff set up for two D animation production, all still on paper, which was mad. You know, like it was kind of a dream to to do it because the office in the morning on the left as you'd walk in this big old like Dundee sort of townhouse thing and it'd be reams and reams of paper ready to be shipped to Europe to be um uh, I don't know like ink and paint or something coming in from Paris that was going to be in between and it was just a crazy process uh, it's very very slow like our quota was eight frames a day at 24 frames a second and that was per character so third of a second a day um so i worked on it for i don't know over three months you'd, you'd get hardly anything done because you'd you know you'd get some retakes or something you'd have to change and hmm. all those kind of things so that was my first proper introduction to animation and then did i went did you start as of, like an apprentice or were you kind of straight into like doing the production stuff yeah so i mean you are on production but you have uh, there's like a, a hierarchy in animation which exists, which I think this is why digital or, you know, computer animation took a while, a bit more to take off because until there's an apprenticeship sort of ladder in something, yeah, you can't just jump in, you know, you need to learn the ropes. So mm. traditional animation on paper used to have a system where you'd come in as a, you know, like a, a cleanup and, and a cleanup assistant. So you'd just be, you know, cleaning up the lines on the animator's work and then you'd go to, a cleanup artist and maybe you transition into animation assistant um, or you could even start there then you'd go up to animator supervisor so I started in cleanup and then I right. went and did a little bit of animation as well and it's tough you know I mean I'm not I don't want to if anybody does listen to this who's done cleanup animation it is a pure art form it's very you know to know how to draw something and keep the form but mm. it's really rough and to know how to put it what they call on model to make it look like the same character it's mm. an amazingly difficult job and when i went into it i just thought oh, i'll do clean up for a few weeks now move on and mm. by the end of it i kind of loved it because it's it's amazingly it's very mindful as well you just sit there and draw for like eight hours in a row it's uh if you like drawing it's a perfect job <laughs> wow <laughs> So how long did you spend with them? I wasn't there that long, probably about five months. Um, they were having a bit of like, it was, I joined towards the end of it a little bit more. And then they were having a bit of a cash flow problem, shall we say. So um, I kind of, there's a few people who were kind of not very happy about payment situations. So I basically said, look, pay me what you owe me and I'm going to go. So um, I used that right. money to then go traveling. I, I went and, you know, took a backpack and went away for a year. And that's kind of something I'd wanted to do for a while, but because I'd got my first kind of like animation job, I was like, okay, now I can work out, you know, what I want to do next. Yeah. Okay. So then when you, where did you go traveling? It was a very sort of like typical route that a lot of people were doing at the time. So this would have been 2000 and, where am I, 2010, it'll, yeah, 2010. Um, I went to, first of all, went to the US and I went to the West Coast, and, uh, drove up to towards, well, getting towards Portland area, but stopping before there. So sort of San Francisco and a bit north and then came back down through, uh, went to sort of like uh, Death Valley National Park and uh, through Yosemite and, and then nice. to Vegas and then New Orleans and D.C., New York for Christmas time and then uh Chicago because my brother was there at the time and then oh, right. flew to Fiji and New Zealand uh, worked in Australia and made a little film uh then to Southeast Asia uh, Cambodia and places like that and then Hong Kong and home so it was yeah it was a good trip ah oh, sounds like a like a literally a tour around the globe my god that's a lot of yeah. places yeah, it was wow. amazing. Uh, and it was, you know, a lot of people stopped and worked on the way. So you'd meet people who, I met a guy who was like 50 and he went traveling when he was 18 for supposedly six months and he hadn't come back. So he's just still doing it. You know, you meet <laughs> all these all these kind of people. Um, but they, the, the, I guess one of the useful things to, to add 
to it for this podcast is that those people I met on that trip gave me the scope of, oh, wow, you really can do anything, you know, like it's not just within business, but, you know, Britain is relatively narrow in terms of its uh, mindset, I think, compared to the rest of the world. You go somewhere like Cambodia and literally, if you want to do something, you can find somebody who, you know, for the right amount of money, will be like, I can set that up for you. You want to go, you know, go like riding motorbikes in the fields, I can get you two motorbikes in 10 minutes kind of thing. It's like, Mm. There's so many opportunities out there and um, different mindsets to what we're used to. So, yes. you know, the, the way how people make livings around the world is incredible. And a lot of them are a lot happier than the, the average person in the West. So yeah. it made me kind of go, oh, what do I really, what do I really want to do, you know, with my life? And what would I be happy doing for it? Yeah. So it gave you a different insight, I guess, on learning by traveling around the globe. You mentioned there that you did a little, you just fleetingly said, oh, whilst I was there, I made a film or something. Um, yeah. So I was in Melbourne and I'd sort of settled there for a little bit and it's expensive and I was kind of doing a little bit of work on the side, but um, found a place to, to rent. And then I, I I was really interested in doing something to do with animation because I was going to be there for several months. And I, I went to um, RMIT University, Royal Melbourne, and uh, I just literally went to the animation department because I found out online they had an animation department. So I just got yeah. the tram in and um, just kind of hung around and says to the guy who worked in the animation department, he says, yeah, and I told him I'm a animator and I'm I'm here for several months and I'm looking for somewhere to make a film and a computer to borrow because I didn't have anything like that with me. I didn't even have a smartphone at that time. So no. um and he he was like typical Australian like really relaxed and quite friendly. So he just says like yeah sure uh, let me go and have a look and see what the <laughs> head of the department says and and they were like oh yeah we've got this office with this this Mac and uh, we've got software on it and stuff and and so we kind of had a, an official kind of meeting. And um, and then they gave me a, a card to get access, and they said, "Well, yeah, well, if if you give give us a few lectures for our students, you can have this space." So, um, oh, wow. I, I talked talked them through the process of what I was doing with this film, and it was all drawn in what was Flash, you know, Adobe Animate, and it was basically about a story that developed when I was in New Orleans, something that I saw in Jackson Square. And so I started doing sketches in my sketchbook whilst I was traveling. And then when I got there, I just made a film out of it. Oh, just just literally just did that. And um, but had you lectured before that? Yeah, so I actually when I was still in Southampton, I worked for my university because I got a first in animation. And so they invited me back to help with the final films to help, you know, mentor people who would then third years how um, you know how to put a film together yeah and I added a few extra bits on like I was pretty good with After Effects and things like that and um, I was quite into life drawing so I took some of them, their classes like sort of stewarded the life drawing and kind of organized some bits with the model and things um, and so I did that in Southampton for several years whilst I was kind of balancing this design illustration work because that kind of was part-time bits of work that kept me ticking over yeah. Uh, so I'd had experience by literally being dropped in it. And it's interesting because like, I still remember the first lecture I ever did. And my head lecturer, just a uh, previous head lecturer, just kind of was like, yeah, just just get in there. You'll, you'll pick it up. Like, you know what you're talking about. So, you know, just um, tell them what they need to know. And he, he had confidence in me that I'd just probably, you know, work it out because yeah. uh, obviously I'm going to react to what people say. And, so the first one, I was really nervous, and I think I probably talked like a million miles an hour, and nobody <laughs> took anything in. But I, I got there, and that it's very, as I'm sure you find as well, it's very um, addictive to kind of to help people in a way because you get a sense mm. of well-being out of it, and it, mm. it's also addictive for me because if I I feel like oh, okay. I can teach that better. I can get that information across better next time. And I can, maybe I can slim this down and maybe I can. And when I see some stuff on YouTube now of people teaching things, uh, I do analyze it and I go, wow, that's a really clever way of getting that concept across or, you know, so I really enjoy the process of education and how 
you know, I, it's the same as everyone being creative. I think everybody is an educator as well. Everybody has something yes. to teach somebody else, which is, you know, like the, I guess the modern kind of like Skillshare uh, idea, but it, it's true. You know, there's so many talented people out yes. there. So it's, for me, it became something I got really interested in. And then when they said in, in Melbourne, hey, if you want to do lectures, I was like, this is perfect because I love doing this stuff as well. <laughs> oh, that yeah that's brilliant i mean that you just went into melbourne and <laughs> into a university college whatever and just went to lecture there i mean i don't know if the times were different then it wasn't that long ago but i suppose no. nowadays people don't have the courage to do that or maybe they do i don't know but yeah i think it's something to do with being like mid 20s and you just kind of I don't know I was I remember no feeling quite yeah and it's like when I got to Australia I was so desperate for money because it's so expensive and I was just like I am not going to survive here if I don't start finding something and I just knew it was like now or never you know because if I didn't find something I had this world-class uh place down the road and I was like I just need to go and ask you know I'm doing nothing yeah. else um yeah and it, weirdly at that time I do think the modern day of kind of like social media and stuff, which was just kind of kicking off, you know, Facebook existed, but people weren't using it in the same way as they do now. And especially no. on smartphones and everybody having access. So you didn't have that distraction to the same extent. And I, I've never been one of those people where, um, you know, I always liked to kind of divert towards books or my sketchbook a little bit more than some other people would. So yeah. I think, um, yeah, you just were sat there kind of bored. You did, you couldn't, you could maybe watch films if you wanted to. But for me, I was like, I want to do something. And so, yeah, yeah, I guess I think people do have it. I just think sometimes people hide behind computers a bit more or their smartphones. I think, I think that's a really good point because it is so easy now if you are bored or you can't be bothered to go and look for work to just veg out on your smartphone you know yeah. there's so there's so much opportunity now to get addicted to watching you know binge watching movies or scrolling there i heard the saying ones by some some guys called the minimalists and um they said scrolling is the new smoking because yeah. people are just you know addicted to their phones and just scrolling through them all so that that's a good point but i i suppose you could have also gone and worked in a kitchen and did some washing up of plates yeah it's true although I, the thing is whilst i was at university i used to do summer jobs and i did um i've got two really pivotal like moments of doing part-time work that kind of spurred me on to to do something that I really, you know, like what did I really want to do rather than play yeah. it safe? And my first ever part-time job when I was just 16, I worked in uh, the co-op in my local like town. And yes. my first week, uh, a woman was retiring and she was in her mid early 60s, I think. And um, she came over to me and she said, oh, you know, I've had a job here since I was, I think, 18. And it's like play your cards right and it's a job for life sort of thing and i just for me i was like that is not what i want i don't i don't want to stay in this town for that long and so that kind of scared the wits out of me uh, and then when i did have in my second year of university i had a, a job at a kitchen in a in the same town um it was like at the new gastro pub place and i worked at the back like yeah. washing pots and then i eventually did a little bit of like helping out with food and bits but and i did not like that job one bit it was it was hot it was hard work um yes i just used to get on with it and then just just go home as quick as possible on my bike sort of thing and yes. it, it really motivated me second year going into my third year i've never done you know i've done no work on the ideas for my final film i did this job and i was i got back and i was so motivated i was like i mm. do not want to do this kind of thing and i've heard other similar things from people who in animation um you know because you do need to be very motivated to do something creative because it's competitive and one of my friends 
from Birmingham where he spent the summer like digging ditches and stuff and he came back and he was like a changed man because he was like no <laughs> I'm going to work hard now so. oh, right yeah so that, that oh, brilliant brilliant okay anyway I, I diverted you you went off traveling I, I wanted to delve in more what you were doing in Melbourne so I'm really glad you've shared that but then when you came back via Hong Kong what what happened next when you got back to the UK so um yeah it was kind of like what what to do next and uh, i kind of had a bit of a, a reset time like i was i was back home at my mom's and i was sort of just you know the the afterglow of traveling starts to wear off when you're like oh, what am i gonna do now and i just mm. decided okay well i'm gonna look for an animation job i've done this little film i've done other little bits but i, I had all sketchbooks of kind of my travels and things and I just felt a lot more positive and confident as well. I think that was the difference. I, I just had this kind of mindset now that I can do the job. Uh, I often tell people my advice. It's for animation, but it's for any job I think you want. Is You've got to think about it from their point of view. And it, you to them are a gamble. And you are telling them, I'm a good bet. You know, you, you've got, you, can, uh, you can gamble on me and I'm going to be a safe bet. So everything you communicate to them is how... Are you going to um, calm their fear that you're going to be a, a bad choice? So it's like with animation, you have a you know a showreel, a video of the work you've done, and the yes. closer it is to the stuff they want, the more likely they're going to go, "This is perfect." And if you communicate well, and if you're organised and on time, they're like, "Okay, this person's a professional." So my head just kind of went, "I need to do all this stuff," and yeah. um, I applied for a job in applied for quite a few jobs, but I applied for a job in Ireland in, in Dublin. And I really got a good sense about the place because I liked the project. It was about a yeah. little cartoon robot girl and her dad, who was a human. And they went to a different planet each episode. And it was preschool and it, it had like electro mu retro music in it and stuff. It was really fun. Every episode was a different animation challenge, and like floating, bouncing, that kind of stuff, yeah. heavy gravity. So um, I applied for that and I got that job. And then I went to Dublin same backpack uh, this time to Dublin and uh, was there there for a year and it was amazing it was so much fun you know I just I really enjoyed it and I definitely as I think as my my character flourished in that situation because I just got given it was a small studio so I got given loads of opportunities you know I wanted to try something out creatively they'd, they'd give me a chance so it was a really good experience for me wow wow so a year in, in Dublin, I, I lived in Ireland for a while, so Ireland can be beautiful, very yeah. green, very friendly, also very wet, a uh, <laughs> lot of rain. Um, so what happened then when you got back after that trip? <laughs> so that one, yeah, um, that one I'd met a girl uh, who was from uh, Vegas, so Las Vegas, so we were kind of dating and we'd had this plan that, I'd kind of started to get a little bit itchy feet again for traveling a little bit. I still wanted to see other places. And she said, well, you can come to come to mine for three months without a visa. So I thought, okay, I'll take my sketchbook. I'll go live off the strip in Vegas and just borrow her car and like go and draw stuff I saw. So we'd go to, we'd go to like old gold mining towns and um, into the desert and kind of Going to Las Vegas Strip and just sitting and watching people is one of the coolest things you oh, could do. It's a weird place. It is bizarre. It so. is. It is yeah. Have you been then? Yes, I have been. Yeah, not for yeah, long. It, I was maybe a week, but yeah, it's it's it's. I went there for a conference, and it was one of these kind of um, anyway esoter esoteric type conferences but i couldn't understand why they were doing it in vegas it was a very weird journey but yeah I, yeah i was at first i was very anti it like oh all this gambling and this that and the other and you go into a hotel you've got to walk through the casino but then i was walking down the strip and i was looking around looking at these billboards that were the size of apartment blocks and you kind of went somebody started this place with literally a pencil and a paper and drew an idea on a piece of paper to say what if yeah. we did this here in the desert you know and you kind of went the the 
it's topical because it's the imagination in our brains in our minds is incredible you know which is the yeah. point you're making um so anyway sorry yeah i divert but it was it was a weird it is a weird place <laughs> still yeah vegas is very strange uh, i was the same when i first got there there's points to me that hated it because you see you see bad poor, uh, bad parts of um, the human psyche and the society we live in and consumerism at its worst and this kind of thing yes. and money. Be yes. But then it's a really interesting place just to look at it, kind of to see, yes. like you say, how it's developed and also um, just to watch like in the daytime, you know, the, the party nighttime thing is the thing that's in all the adverts and the movies. The daytime when it's nice and quiet and people are just wandering around, it is a conference uh venue in in the mm. us i was there and i started to one time i was sitting in this diner thing this old one at the bottom of the strip and i saw this guy go past dressed like a cowboy like jeans kind of like uh <laughs> sort of um what, what i can't remember the shirts the jackets called with the tassels and then a big yes. cowboy hat and like cowboy boots he went past and then two more went past dressed exactly the <laughs> same and then about 20 went past and i was like what is going on and there was the cowboy convention around the corner and it was like <laughs> Uh, it's thousands and thousands of these guys dressed as cowboys and, and girls dressed as cowboys. Unbelievable. And I was like, that is the bizarrest thing I've ever seen. But yes. um, to, to observe that for, for three months was really cool. And then, and then she came over to me and, uh, you know, we traveled around Europe. We went to like Berlin, Amsterdam and places and um, to France and I kind of did some, you know, took some time off and, our relationship didn't work because we had the issues anyway with the US and UK kind of things. But it yes. was just one of those things where we both kind of wanted to make the most of the fact that we're both young and kind of unattached in terms of, um, you know, jobs and whatever. So we just kind of traveled a bit. But that mm. gave me, um, you know, traveled. And then I was like, okay, I really want to get back into animation stuff again. So, mm. um, mm. And I always kept it going and doing small freelance things, but studio work is something that is it's quite a commitment in animation because a project takes a while to do. And yes. so I ended up going to Manchester. And so I came here to work for the, the resurgence of Cosgrove Hall, uh, which is kind of like the Manchester dynasty of animation and um, worked in this big old amazing building in uh, South Manchester and then yeah. went to to brown bag um in manchester and and then i left there just over four years ago to set up my my online training uh, well training online and offline yeah. so that that was an interesting process because the i'd been doing animation in and out of studios and getting a lot of experience and i was getting to the point where i was kind of getting frustrated because i was only ever yeah, we, animation is quite labor intensive and you are only ever, you know, as good as your last project and you've got yes. to keep your journey, man. You're always changing. And I was getting older and I was like, I don't know if I want to keep moving all the time. You know, it's, right. it's, fun, but it's also quite difficult to, like my friends are all over the place and it's really difficult to kind of set down roots with animation. So I just thought I want to set something up myself and I'd seen basically when when i'd been learning toon boom um i'd learned it a bit before but not for production uh, you know this is just another bit of software but it was quite complicated and when we had an official training for it and then i was trying to find out more later on i was just like there's nothing really out there that is what i think is you know useful there was a few videos uh, but it just wasn't really kind of there. And so I just thought, well, I'm just going to put this thing together. I'm just going to try it. I don't want to work in studios anymore. So I'm going to do a bit of freelance and I'm going to try this as an experiment. So I just set yes. up a training academy and ran it as a project. And yeah, it, it, it took off. People liked it. People I'd worked with in studios, you know, I was open to their feedback and said, what do you want me to teach? Like, what do you want? people to come to you with knowledge wise yes and they just tell me and then i just make courses around that and it's like Brilliant. it sounds really like straightforward but a lot of people i think in business don't ask the people they want to be their customers what they want you know if you ask them 
Yes. I think they're, they're afraid of being told it's not what you do, you know? So if you ask them and say, what do you want? And then they say, oh, I'd love this, you know, then you just make mm -hmm. that and tweak it. it. You'll get a lot of variation, but somewhere in it, you'll get a middle ground. Yeah. Wow. And had you, I mean, obviously you'd done lecturing, so you had a bit of experience in the bit of educating. Um, but had you learned from somebody how to put you know a training package an online training package together or did you just have to figure it out yourself yeah i just kind of figured it out myself i mean i've done things projects in the past you know when i've worked for myself and i just uh, i'm relatively good at researching i feel like i learned a lot of research skills at university i think that's one of the best things i take away from university is research skills knowing how yes. to find information because nowadays more than ever you know you need to know how to look for something correctly because if you just type it into the search engine you'll get you know the middle of the road answer so yes. you need to know how to search deeper and, and use different things not just the internet yeah. uh, so i gradually built kind of my knowledge up i spent i think i probably spent about the first year well six months quite intensive learning about online platforms video hosting calendar yes. booking systems and this was um skillshare was there and it was doing stuff but other things weren't really quite at the same level um mm. like there there was no real standout calendar booking system at that point which you could buy as a service and i can remember yeah. looking at getting somebody to custom script something that linked with a google calendar and and then mm. i found uh, something else that had just been launched and i was like this is exactly what i need whereas now four years later people drop it into conversation like it's always been there you know that's so right. there's a lot of research around that but the, the weird thing is the thing i've noticed is a lot of people don't want to put the work in you know everyone's looking for a shortcut and i get when the pandemic hit last year i would get people contact me and literally ask me can you tell us exactly what you do because uh, we'd like to copy it and they, they wouldn't really say anything about we want to hire you as a consultant it's just kind of like could you give us some friendly advice and tell yes. us exactly how you how you run your platform and you know i can point them in directions of of where to find out information but they just want the answer so yeah i think you know if you take the deep dive if you're going into something new you can kind of become your own little expert and then you can kind of mm. start to go okay you know i, I knew i was going to have to do it a lot and I knew I was going to have to make some mistakes. And, yeah. you know, I'm very open to people giving me feedback. Uh, I always say, like, if, if, I'm, if I'm always getting reviews where I say it's perfect, that's not very useful to me. I, I want people to tell me, oh, the audio was a bit off there and, and that file wasn't quite right. And I didn't really understand what you said there because then I can improve it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it is a difficult thing to do. There's no question about it. I've put online courses together and it's very time consuming and you need to think about some sort of structure as well, yeah. you know, to try and put yourself into the learner's shoes or chair when they're sitting in front of the computer trying to click through these videos. And um, certainly what I've noticed, and of course I've, been on your course and I've been doing the online course is the videos the you know the short the kind of short videos like under 10 minutes they're, they're really that is like the sweet spot what I've learned because I've put some courses up on Udemy and that's what they tell the mm. you know any course instructors try and put your videos up for less than 10 minutes because that's just enough content uh for people to absorb and do something with you know to 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 take it in but and also the other thing of course is i mean i when which what year did you start putting this together um well i i started in 2017 really i mean i started in 2016 uh, i had the, the plan a little bit but I did Toon Boom's um, certification thing, which they, uh, their certification at that point for 
becoming like an expert or whatever it was was yes it wasn't it wasn't as widespread it was quite niche so when I did it I was as far as I was aware nobody's told me any different I was the only person in the UK who was a, an expert and I just couldn't quite believe when I took it that nobody else mm. had quite done that yet but it wasn't here it was just new tech no. so yeah I just was kind of lucky right place right time I just thought I'll go for it um and so that gave me the the knowledge of of things to kind of go okay well I can I know this stuff and I I, I yeah. know what I want to learn as an animator and so I'll start kind of putting those bits together um and I started to put it together and then it took me to literally leave studio work because I knew I needed to work on it more full time yes I couldn't yes I just couldn't fit it around nine to six hours you know and traveling and everything else I just I had nothing left in the tank and I was getting burnt out so I was like I need to just you know cut ties and I was nervous you know I was no income got a mortgage to pay that kind of stuff but yes uh it was motivating to do that as well yeah 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 I mean, online learning, you know, for years they've been saying it's going to be big. But mm. now, you know, they're really saying it's going to be huge. So there's a massive opportunity for providing content online. There's no doubt about it. And then, so tell us a bit. So after having created that, you know, give, I know you're saying you do a bit of freelancing as well, but. How did you go about then finding clients for the course? Well, I mean, so I've got two main main sort of uh, clients, I guess. I have studios, animation studios, and well, enterprises and things. So I get I get uh, universities who contract me to come in and teach as kind of a kind of a technician, they call it, where you're sort of an associate. Yes. Uh, and studios get me to come in to train up for a project and then I have individuals who just take my courses right. so initially when I set it up it was it was individuals and then um, people there's like one or two people who really helped me out there's a guy called Andy Wyatt who's uh, Toon Boom's like he, he's worked in animation for years but he's he started working with Toon Boom and as kind of their rep in the UK and Ireland and he right when he went to a studio, he would say, there's this guy who's doing this now. Right. Um, so it, he kind of helped me out. And then I would, uh, I guess in a way, help them out because I'm training people. Like I'm paying for the software, I'm paying for the licenses. So it didn't cost them as a software company anything for me to do what I was doing. Yes. So they obviously, somebody uh, was obviously switched on and went, well, hang on a minute, this guy's going to promote our stuff for free. We just got a you know, drop his name in and say, well, we've got somebody here. Now they've changed their their approach slightly now. They're a bit more kind of, they want to use their people um, from the company a bit more and you've got to be a bit more rigid. It used to be all under my banner and now they do their training under their banner. But that's yes. just something that I always expected when I put yeah. the plan together for this business. I thought it was going to be two years until, I'd get two years until somebody came and basically yes. tried to compete a bit more. Um, and I got three years out of it, so I got an extra year. But okay. uh, yeah, I, I found people through old studio uh, connections, animators, and things. Yes. And then you know you get in one studio, and and then they pass you on. And it's it's just kind of a small industry still, so it, it worked. You know, I didn't really have to do a lot of advertising. I generally used Instagram to get my stuff out there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it was a part time thing, you see. So I was trying to keep it quite small, and so okay. that I could grow slowly and small amount of students, so that I could, you know, like I wouldn't get into a mess if something wasn't quite right. I could actually fix yes. it because I was taking on in the initial courses I'd run. Sometimes there'd be ten people and even less, and I could I could literally have calls with them all and deal with it all. Any problems, I could just have an hour call with them and, and deal with it so um and then as i kind of refined it that's when it became more of a, a set sort of um plan but uh yeah it was it was just kind of a, a natural organic thing over probably about two years it started yeah. to grow on its own brilliant and how did your association come about with screen skills screen skills so um, it's interesting because a lot of these places, so there's Screen Skills Island as well, which is a funding body 
set up, you know, to keep because of these tax breaks and for the yes. film and TV industries. The government obviously want to keep the skill level high. Um, Ireland had it before the UK. The UK then matched it. That's why we're having a good uh, time of animation in the UK at the moment. So if you ever hear about that, uh, that tax break going away, that will be probably a sign of bad things to come. So it's basically because there's a bit of money to be had from the government and to help out with productions, um, that means people are going to invest in training. That means the government's investing in training. And so my first thing was actually to contact the different funding bodies. So I contacted Screen Skills in the UK and the one in Ireland at the same time. But Ireland yes. were much quicker to act, and they just said, yeah, we'll have you to come and do stuff. So I was going over to Ireland and doing training things. I eventually got, uh, you know, I saw an opportunity with Screen Skills, to, and I just pitched them an idea. Um, I wrote them like a one-page, because a lot of that work people don't see. You know, it's like the iceberg thing. They see your success, and it's just a very tiny tip, and... I mean, there's months and months of me writing things and changing things with uh, Abigail at Screen Skills and, and just kind of her being really patient with me as I gradually, she's like my editor for a book. She's just kind of telling me what I can and can't do. And yes. and it took a while, you know, um, to formulate. I mean, started working on the plan for that probably end of October and that course ran in April and May this year. So right. it was a lot of a lot of work. But, you know, now we have a blueprint. That's something that I can... And work on more and it's really it's really great that there's th there's those opportunities for people because you know mm -hmm. they gave bursaries to a few people they um you know are helping reduce the cost of something that basically is a barrier to entry so yeah and they're very much about diversity and inclusion targets as well so it's kind of like they really want to make sure that you know not just the the london bubble gets it or manchester yes. bubble or whatever they want to make sure it's spread all over the country yeah fantastic yeah i mean anything like that usually takes six months doesn't it to get mm. somewhere and that's that's you don't think these days the sales cycle should be quicker but it isn't it it's always around six months before people make up their mind to move forward with something uh, I, I wish it was quicker in this country, I have to say. Well, in the world. But America may be a bit quicker, uh, probably about three months. Um, right. Wow. So uh, just an incredible journey, all the different things that you've experienced. So how, what happens like today? You know, we've had the lockdown, pandemic and everything else. So how... What are you are what are you involved with today, uh, in terms of the scope of things that you know in animation or something else? Uh, so this year, well, last year actually, going back to the pandemic, it's obviously running something online is a little bit. It can get a bit intense and a bit over the top but when everybody goes online. Weirdly for me, it wasn't like a sort of. Uh, a crazy runaway success thing because it's still just me doing it so I did hire an assistant um, at one point and then I had another assistant but when you hire other people to do things you need to tell them what to do and then it's yes. like almost another job in itself yes. so you end up working more you know and that was that was that was tricky so I actually kind of just and the pandemic also taken its toll on people mentally. You know, you feel like if you run an online business, you're like, I should be killing it right now. You know, this is my time. But there's yeah. a lot of pressure with that. And I didn't really, I wasn't really feeling that, um, like, I'm just going to, you know, go all, all out on advertising because I was really aware of people losing jobs. And, yes. you know, I don't want to be taking money off them for stuff where they might not get a job. I so... Know. It, um, it was tricky. I mean, I didn't really push it last year that much. Um, I just carried on ticking over. I had work. I had more work from universities and bits and bobs, but it wasn't mm. some sort of like crazy success. But I used it to to kind of sit back and work out what's my next step with this. Do I want to keep yes. doing this same thing? Because I've been doing it for three years at that point. And I was like, you know, what's the next place where this is going to go? Because I can't yeah. just, it's never just going to stay as it is. And then so this year um i've taken it a little bit easier because i've been working on some of my own projects as well but i'm still mm -hmm. doing my training um testing the water with a few other bits like the screen skills I, i've got a couple of plans for um changing 
the courses because they have evolved now. That that what I initially set up was there's a lot of people who need uh, the basics just to get going, and now yes. there's a lot of people who need the more advanced stuff. And yes. my my plan has always been to try and create this this pathway for people where kind of like um sort of like an animation finishing school in a way in an old-fashioned term but it's basically mm. b- to bridge the gap between when people leave university and get a job because in animation you don't need to go to university you can have the the raw skills it, university just teaches you like research skills and other things it gives you the the network it gives you the expertise and there's a lot of good things from it but yeah. that doesn't mean it's right for everybody so I'm looking to try and create something that somebody can come to at whatever point in that timeline and join on. And it's kind of like an apprenticeship scheme, but with school, with the flexibility of what the modern way of learning has given us. So, you know, a blended kind of online, offline thing, uh, depending on where you are in the world, you know, to suit your setup. Because one of the best things about doing the courses I do is when I am running a course and I sit down at the weekend, because you do have to work weekends when you do a, you know, an online course, it, I'll sit down and from eight o'clock in the morning, I'll be talking to people in Australia and New Zealand, and then I'll gradually move through and I might be in uh, Sri Lanka and then I'll go to the US later on in the day. And it, it's amazing. It's like I'm flying around the world in my computer <laughs> and just chatting to people. Yeah. And that's one of the coolest things about it. And I, I love that. So I want to keep that openness um, yeah. Yeah. to be able to teach lots of different people. And so right now, I'm, I mean, I'm getting married in uh, four weeks today, I'll be married. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on with that. And yes. it's, that's kind of taken a bit of uh, a bit of my time away. But after, after that, I think I'm going to tweak things and um, relaunch a few bits. Uh, so yeah, that's the plan right now. Sounds very, very exciting. And, and well done for, you know, evolving it and keeping it alive. Because you know, we, none of us can just sit and go, right, I've done that now. This will set me through till retirement or whatever. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. You've got to, and things change, you know, nothing's permanent. You've, you, you, you have new ideas, you're, you've got a creative mind and definitely is the way to go. Fantastic, Adam, a really interesting journey. And I, I really, look forward to to seeing where it goes next um i've i've enjoyed kind of being a bit of an apprentice uh working with you has been very very satisfying and i've got a huge amount still to learn but i tell you what i would never have gotten started even if i didn't have that you know leg up support uh, that i've been able to experience with you so uh, yeah, much appreciated with that. Um, so if people want to find out more about you uh, online, where where can they find me? Find you rather, and uh, <laughs> I, I will include the uh, links in the show notes as well. But if you could verbalize it, some people are auditory listeners. <laughs> Yes. So if you want to find uh, my academy online, it's adamsanimationacademy.com. So all one word, uh, competition for the longest website name there, but uh, adamsanimationacademy.com. And and then my personal website is adamoliver.com. It's got some of my sketches and like sketchbook stuff on that. It's actually some things from when I was traveling on there as well, which is interesting for people to see. So uh, yeah, and thanks very much, Michael, for both being part of the course and being a good student and uh, also, uh, yeah, for today. Uh, my absolute pleasure. And um, maybe one day we'll, we'll meet each other in the same room and we can shake hands. <laughs> Who yeah, knows? I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought it's too hard to arrange. You know, you're in the same country at least, but uh, yeah, that's right. sometime soon. Yeah, but if you're ever doing any lecturing in Birmingham, uh, let me know because I'm about 35, 40 minutes away from Birmingham. So if you're ever in any universities there, give me a shout and I'll buy you lunch. Yeah, all right. I'll hold you to that. You've said it out loud now. It's recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It's on record. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. I've really enjoyed chatting with you and speak to you soon. Take care for now. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Cheers. Bye. 
If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.